All right, welcome back to Noob School. This is where we usually deal with great salespeople and great business people and go back to when they started and see what we can learn from them. Today we have a rare exception. David Grizel, Dr. Grizel to me. Um, he started out, when we started out as salespeople, he started out in med school at uh, West Texas. North Texas. North Texas. West Texas. That was a jazz school. It was, it was one of the schools, a famous jazz school. But anyway, um, he started out as a, as a doctor, very serious uh, doctor, which he can talk more about. And um, he's going to talk today about you know, selling as a doctor in a very serious situation. Uh, selling, I'm sure, within the administration, um, within the practice he's with or he owned or however it worked. Um, and then at some point, after 30-plus years, he decided to transition into the world of venture and angel investing, um, where he's deploying mostly his own money to bet on mostly young people that need to talk about, guess what, sales. So uh, David has become you know, more of a sales a leader uh, in this new role that he's chosen. He's also dealing with people about sales, and I think it's going to be a really interesting, different conversation today we're going to have. So welcome. Welcome aboard. Oh, thank you. Yeah, man. So let's start at the beginning. Um, when, when you were in med school, normally ask people about their initial sales experiences. What was kind of, what were your sales experiences in med school and kind of getting your first position after that? Well, I think in medicine, it's really about uh, establishing a relationship with your patients uh, because you're oftentimes telling them something they don't want to hear. Right. Uh, and so that requires a relationship and trust. And so um, to really be able to reach somebody, you have to establish that trust and that commonality. Uh, and so that, I think that's an experience that occurs over a career. You don't learn that in medical school necessarily. You get practice, mm -hmm. but you don't necessarily learn it. Mm -hmm. Huh. And so how does that occur? Can you describe how that occurs with a patient? I think it's uh, watching your mentors and experiencing all the interactions they have, some of which are bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of your mentors are terrible bedside manner mm -hmm. doctors, mm -hmm. and you learn from that as much as you do from the doctors that have really great manner. And you have some, some stars that you encounter um, that you really remember your entire career. Yeah. And you remember a lot of things that they did 20 years ago, and and it sticks with you forever. And and so I had a couple of mentors like that. Not a lot, but I had a couple of mentors like that. And, you know, medicine is full of assholes, honestly, mm -hmm. and, and just like any business. And so part of the, the deal in terms of learning how to relate to patients or customers is – picking the mentors that you can admire and emulate mm -hmm. and then the ones that you don't. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. that, I think, is a big part of it. Interesting. Yeah, as a patient, you know, <clears throat> until I'm talking to you right here, I never really thought about a doctor being anything but a doctor. I, don't, I forget that it might have just come from a staff meeting with some jackass, you know, talking about the new you know, reimbursement policy or something. Exactly. I mean, come on. <laughs> I, I want to talk to like you know this 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 person I'm really looking up to who's always dressed perfectly and happy and re excited to see me and right you know that's what you somebody ready to to take care of you to focus on you right focus on you that's a great sales lesson there we've got some short video work we've done on that very subject but just that, that someone will be you know looking at you and thinking about you versus look at look at me how great I am. Interesting. Right. Oh, that's so cool. That's so cool. Um, how did you end up going to med school? Why did you decide to do that? Well, I was interested in science as a, as a kid in high school, and it just seemed like a natural thing, uh, partly because my best friend's dad was a doctor, and so he influenced me a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had the opportunity, so I took it. And one of the things at that point in time that was really cool about medicine is you were, you were your own person. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you would go out and establish your own practice and you had your own patients and you, you decided how your practice would run and how things would go. And you related to other doctors, you worked together. Um, you know, you weren't employed, you, you were an independent pr uh, practitioner. So that was very attractive to me. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you were an entrepreneur. Exactly. By nature, I was. Yeah. And then pretty, now it's like, you got to be. Now you're an employee by, big... by a corporation. Yeah. yeah. 
shame that people like you get out, you know. Well, I mean, it's, it, it'll, the pendulum will probably swing uh, the other way at some point because, honestly, many physicians are dissatisfied with the way it is. And if you think about it, if, if you're a patient and you want to see a doctor, you, you want a doctor that's thinking about you exclusively mm-hmm. and has your interests at heart. Yeah. But when you're employed by a corporation, there are a lot of competing interests. And it's not that they can't take good care of you mm-hmm. or they're not focused on you. It's just that you have a lot of competing interests. And... Uh, one of the biggest competing interests that was, the, you know, the killer for me was the electronic medical record and okay. where you go and see the doctor and instead of talking to the patient, <laughs> you're you're doing this, trying to keep up with the notes yeah. so you can meet the record requirement for that visit so, the, so they can get paid. Oh, so is that requirement that you fill out every blank or a certain number of words, or what is it? Yeah, there's very specific requirements of information that you need to provide uh, <laughs> the, in order to get reimbursed. And so if you don't do it right, you know, your boss, you know, lets you know, and your your pay is is tied to that. And so it's yeah. it's a it's a corporate system. It's not it's not bad. It's yeah. just not great. Yeah. Is that, that the doctor's version of the TPS report? Okay. <laughs> What's that? I don't know what well, that the is. Off the office, the movie, the office. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. TPS report. So, you know. yeah. um, so let's talk about sales, Ken. What's something that you kind of thought in your head about sales and salespeople when you were you know, going through the medical ranks that turned out to be different the more you learned about sales? Well, you know, my experience with sales was primarily uh, representative selling uh, medical devices, not really drugs, because in my specialty, we dealt with uh, equipment, mainly computerized equipment. Okay. And so we would be sold by technical representatives. And uh, it, it was a, v- a highly variable experience because some of them were mainly technical and not really oriented towards sales. Some of them were all sales and very little uh-huh. technical expertise. But the thing that sticks with me the most is we had one, I had a system that we used that operated our equipment. And it basically was a, a way for you to collect information about a patient's condition, design their treatment, and then tra- export that information to the treatment machine. Yeah. So the treatment machine had the directions to, to do everything yeah. correctly. And I remember sitting down with the salesman one time and telling him, you know, this, this system you have, has a lot of room for improvement. And if, if you could just make some of these improvements, um, it would be so much better and you'd be able to compete with the, the big dogs because they were a small independent player. Mm-hmm. And he goes, well, yeah, but, you know, the, the, the they, they have a plan, the corporate plan is this, and they have to meet all these requirements and, and this thing, uh, you know, that we have to meet, meet the middle of the road and everyone else kind of has to accommodate that. Um, and, I, and I told him, I remember this very specifically, I go, you know, you're going to get competed out of the market. You, you're going to lose this account if mm-hmm. you don't make these things better. Mm-hmm. And he goes, well, well, we'll look into it, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and sure enough, two years later, they lost the account. Yeah. And they switched to another product, which is was, was incrementally better, but still not great. Because the bottom line, they weren't listening to their customers. Right. They weren't listening to their customers. Yeah. And and it was it, to some degree it was a corporate thing where the corporate decision has been that's not our priority. Yeah, yeah. And I would I would I would say of course I wasn't there, but I would say that even if the sales rep had been told that and he thought that he should still escalate, he should go to the highest he could in his company and say I've got a very important doctor in a very important field who would like to talk about this device. I mean that's what every CEO and board wants to hear. They want to hear that. You feedback. would think. You would think. And even if it's not true, I would still try if I was a salesperson. I think to be a successful salesperson, you should do that. And if that gets you fired, it's probably a good thing because yeah. you don't want to work for that organization. Right. I mean, ultimately, the top-down organization in today's environment doesn't work. Right. Not for long. No. I agree. And so you, 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 you were called on by quite a few, I would say, relatively high-end technical medical device salespeople. Any stories of things they did well? Um, probably the thing they did best was to sit down and go through a case with me and spend an hour and go through a case or two with me and show me a lot of the features that I wasn't aware of and didn't know about Mm -hmm. that would make my job easier and, and make the work better. Okay. So user success, that was the feature that was most valuable to me. And these reps were, were those reps that took that seriously. 
because honestly, many of them, once they made the sale, you never saw them again. Yeah. Yeah. I see that all the time in sales. You know, I've been doing just the sales game a, a long time, but you know, it, like uh, investment bankers, for example, you know, they, they get, they help sell a company, buy a company, take someone public, whatever. And it's a big deal. They get a big paycheck. They get like 6% yeah. you know, of the deal. And you might not ever hear from them again. Right. I'm like, you're kidding me? I mean, this guy, Grisel, just sold a company. He, he's probably going to do it again. At least send him a Christmas card. Well, you know, I think it's it's to some to some degree it's the policy of the of the company, the reimbursement policy. Uh-huh. So the way they reimburse a salesman, they incentivize them for making the big sale, but they don't don't incentivize them to make sure that customer is utilizing that product to its fullest mm. potential. He's chasing the next one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, and so he's he's not getting paid to go back to that guy and say, "Hey, you know, there's these features you're not using. You yeah. could use these, and you would love this system even more if yeah. you use these features. It'd make your job easier and better." And and they're not incentivized to do that. Interesting. Um, is there one thing about sales you wish you'd have known before you got started? Um. Well, yeah, I think I think probably the thing that that I learned probably when I was doing my MBA program was, and it was sort of a tangential thing, you know, to the side that uh, the most powerful sales tool that a salesman can have is to love the product they're selling, Mm -hmm. that they think it's so great that everybody ought to use it. Mm -hmm. And if the company you're working for doesn't have a product like that, you need to look for a different job Mm -hmm. because no one wants to sell something that you're not enthusiastic about. And even if you do a good job selling, you're not going to sell as much as if you have a product that you really love and you really believe in. So I think that's the thing that I've learned that has really stuck with me in the last five years. Mm -hmm. And so you transitioned, I kind of glossed over that in my introduction, but you transitioned to become, and you were an angel investor already when you were still practicing, but you became a full-time angel investor, and now you have an angel uh, investor podcast for the Mm -hmm. Southeast. Yes. And you also uh, organize other angels to, to do bigger deals. Is that right? Yeah, we, we, we're, we have a fund with Venture South. So we do uh, fund investing for, for people that want to benefit from angel investing, but don't have the time or interest to get into the detail that's required to keep from losing your shirt. Okay. I gotcha. I gotcha. That's cool. And um, what have you learned about sales from dealing with these mostly young founders of these angel backed companies? Well, I've learned that uh, they, they need to be passionate about their business because they can't be successful if they're not. Mm-hmm. If they're just doing it to try to make a buck, uh, you're not going to be able to convince people that your business is worth investing in, and you're not going to be able to convince your customers that you have an awesome product that they should love. Mm-hmm. So that's the passion is the number one thing. But also, you need to know your customer. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen entrepreneurs – come up with a great idea, develop a great product, and then discover, hey, nobody wants this. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't they want this? This is ridiculous. And, and so it's because they, when, they're, when they have the idea and they're thinking about their product, they need to be talking to the customer and find yeah. out, well, what do you think about this idea? Yeah. And what do you think about this prototype I made that yeah. does this? Yeah. And you, you learn a whole lot, and they, they will turn your business around for you when it needs to be turned around, not after it's failed. Yeah, yeah. I agree with you. I call it the rule of 10. I say, you know, I, I want the young entrepreneur to physically be in front of 10 people that are likely buyers and say, I want your opinion on this. And of course, at the end, if it does what I say it's going to do, would you pay this much money for it to help you do this mm-hmm. and see what the number is? Yeah. Zero or 10 or six right. or four, you know, whatever. But usually, when I, in my experience, it's closer to, to, to 10 or zero. Mm-hmm. It's like all of them don't want. Yeah, it it's or, on or off. Yeah, but you don't. You can't find that out by listening to the CEO talk about how great it is. No. <laughs> now you you have to sit down with the customers, and you need to know these customers. And and uh, you know, I experience that just about every day. I'm I'm involved right now with a turnaround effort of a a company that has a, a pretty good product, and they have some good customers. The problem is the their manufacturing costs are too high. Uh-huh. So they have to redesign their product, but they don't have any money. Mm-hmm. So they've got to get new investors. And and so I'm digging into this, and a big part of this is like, well, well, how do you sell this? And the guy that's CEO is an engineer, 
And so he goes into this long technical explanation, probably 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I knew what the problem was right there. He didn't have a salesman because he sure wasn't one. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he's a great guy, great technical guy, but not a salesperson. Right. And right. and he, he couldn't explain it in a couple of sentences. Mm -hmm. You got to be able to say in a couple of sentences what the problem this is solving for you. <laughs> yeah. And he couldn't do it. Yeah. We're going to keep your food cold. You know, yeah. Something like that. Something like that. Yeah. And, and you know, we're going to, we're going to make your drive to work so much better. Yeah. Or, you know, we're going to keep your bathtub clean. You yeah. don't have to clean it. Yeah. And that's simple things like that. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. Huh, that's good. Um, and another thing, backing up a little bit, I mean, David, you know, went through med school, was practicing doctor for, you know, 30 years. And then as he transitioned, he went back to Clemson Business School. That's right. As MBA at Clemson. So yeah. most of the people that watch our podcast, we've got like, I think, 12,000 now, but they're mostly in the upstate. And I just want to first make a pitch for, for Clemson, but then get your, your feedback on it. But my son, Jack, went to Clemson, got his MBA. And I just think it's great. The fact that they moved downtown, they're in a beautiful building. Yep. They have a lot of professors, I think, that are business people. Mm -hmm. um, so I go over there sometime and talk to them when they let me. But uh, anyway, I would encourage salespeople. I didn't do this when I was a salesperson, uh, when I was a young salesperson, because I was too, I don't know what I was, too something, anxious. or Too much little, testosterone? I don't know what it was. <laughs> I didn't need no stinking business school, but <laughs> I wish I would have because, you know, Warren Buffett says it's the, one of the most important things you can do. You need, you need to learn the language of business before you go become this great business person. Well, it's, it's one way to do it, and it's fairly efficient. You can, you can knock it off in, you know, 15 months. So that's pretty efficient. You can learn the same thing in the school of hard knocks. It just takes longer. Right. And it's a little bit less comprehensive and less organized. And you can teach yourself. Uh, there's some great online resources, and you can learn a lot of these lessons yourself. But, man, you have to be disciplined, right. and you've got to be really deliberate to make sure you're getting the big picture. Uh, so I think the, uh, an MBA has value. Right. I, I, I talk to people all the time say, you don't need an MBA. You could be successful doing this. And I don't disagree with that. You can be. Mm -hmm. It's just that depends on what you want and how you want it. What I wanted was I wanted knowledge and network. Yeah. I didn't want a degree. I didn't need a Stanford degree because yeah. I'm not going to go work for anybody. Right. I, nobody's <laughs> going to care, right. you know. Right. And so uh, if you if you want a brand name MBA degree, then you go, you know, to Stanford or you go to Harvard or yeah. you go to Penn or someplace like that. And and that's very competitive. And and that gets you into the corporate world if that's what you want to do. Yeah. But if you want to be an entrepreneur, you know, you don't need those things. And and what you really need is a network right. and uh, you need knowledge. And so that's what I put on the priorities. And I felt like I got that at Clemson. And it's a great network. You know, I, I, I to this day, interact with people that I went went through my MBA program with. Yeah. And I, I talk to people all the time that we have the commonality of Clemson. And uh, the connections are great and the knowledge was great. It didn't teach me everything I needed to know, but it sure got me started. Yeah. And I think that's how we got together was through Matt Klein. Yeah, who introduced us. Yeah, so and Matt's a great. I think a yeah, great he's an entrepreneur step. deluxe. Yeah, he's he's awesome. Um, so very important. What's your favorite word? Entrepreneurship. Okay, nice. <laughs> hadn't heard that one before. That's great. That's great. Why did you pick that? Because that's that's what my life is all about. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good. You have one last best piece of advice for the noobs just getting started. Um, I, I would just echo what I previously said, which is, you know, if if you want to get into sales, make sure you got a product that that you really love and relate to. Um, and if you don't, then you need to look for a different job, or or maybe don't take that job if 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 they have a set of things to sell that you don't really believe in. You need to keep looking. Yeah. I think that's great advice. Anything else you want to promote about what you're doing now with your podcast? Or your um, well, sure. I'd love people to listen to my podcast. It's directed primarily to people that uh, are founders of startups or they're investors in startups or they want to be one of those too. Mm -hmm. And so we talk about all kinds of things related to startup investing, successful startups, and uh, we do interviews with people that have companies that have had – great success and some that haven't. Uh, and so we tell stories mm -hmm. and it's pretty interesting. I think people will like it. And how would they find it? What's it called? So it's venture in the South. Okay. So all one word.com. Um, and it's on Spotify and, and, 
uh, Apple Podcasts, of okay. course, and all the other. Thank you. Podcasts. When you run out of other people, I'd like to be on there. Okay, yeah, sure. That'd be great. <laughs> I can interview you, and we, 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 there's a lot we could learn from you. Well, we'll see about that. So thank you very much, David, for being on the on the podcast today. You you are now hereby the smartest person ever on the Noob School. <laughs> well, so, thank you for having me. Thank you very much.